So what happens when you combine two comedy giants in a concept film most people found more unsettling than funny? One that was panned, deep dish panned by the critics, and yet it became an instant favorite among a wide range of A-list talent. Hollywood heavyweights in film, TV, and academia praising it as a glorious accomplishment, an instant classic, even dare some say a masterpiece? But how could so many have gotten it so wrong? Or did they? And how could anyone have thought that Martin Short, as a 10-year-old, would be embraced, praised, or profitable? Sound hammy? It is hammy, because Hollywood actually made it. Is there no end to your madness? As you might have noticed, Hollywood has had a long history of simultaneously duplicating itself, where strikingly similar screenplays are greenlit by competing studios at approximately the same time. Just when you think they can't come up with new ways to be unoriginal, they impress you. From dueling Robin Hoods in 91 to carbon copy White House invasions in 2016, it's almost as though periodically the town turns extra uninventive. And so it was back in 1990 when two films, Problem Child and Clifford, were each underway at their respective studios, Universal and Warner's Orion Pictures, each featuring a Hell on Wheels brat, each causing major mayhem for their frustrated families. Such duplicate projects can easily hurt their counterparts, either critically or financially, especially whichever one happens to make it to market last. After all, it's kind of hard to follow Dr. Strangelove, even though Sidney Lumet's masterful failsafe did just that, with a straight, dramatic telling of a nearly identical concept that's sadly far less remembered today next to Kubrick's spectacular satire. So with this iceberg of duplication on the horizon, as it was in 97 with James Cameron's Titanic and the George C. Scott miniseries you might well have never heard of, well, that's just the sort of scenario that can get studio heads to start second-guessing, even scuttling entire projects rather than run the risk of box office failure. And that's pretty much what the folks at Orion Pictures were thinking regarding their Clifford when someone had a eureka moment. And that someone was Clifford's co-screenwriter and Newhart star Steve Kapman, whose idea was, maybe let's forego a child actor. It definitely raised some very serious questions. Could it work? Would it work? And would God ever forgive them? From David Letterman. If they'd had a child actor in that role, I'm not going to see that movie. But you put Martin Short in that role, and where do I get my tickets? The pitch is pretty simple. Like the 1956 Patty McCormick film it was largely inspired by, you got an evil kid doing evil things. But the secret sauce to Clifford might just be Charles Grodin with his put-upon, pent-up rage, dealing with a 10-year-old nephew who, in Act 1 alone, sabotages a commercial airliner to force its landing so that he might attend an amusement park. You know, you touch the dinosaur. Stefan wanted to stand here. Give me the dinosaur. Delays and minor financial hiccups like Orion filing for bankruptcy meant that competing with Problem Child became something of a non-starter. Because Clifford, intended for an early 90s release, wouldn't make its way to theaters until over four years after production wrap. Meanwhile, Problem Child had exploded into its own surprise franchise, as had 1993's Dennis the Menace. But those successes did little to quell studio concerns that not casting an actual child might not fly with finicky audiences. Along the way, original director Steve Campman was out, replaced by Paul Flaherty, brother of Short's SCTV co-star Joe. As the production scrambled to find ways to convey the size concerns, when a six-foot man plays a character 18 inches shorter. They'd make Short appear shorter through camera angles and exaggerated props and costumes. But there was little they could do to mask the strangeness of it all. 
the eerie spectacle of a demented man-child who evoked Chucky more than anything else, really, and not so much in a funny way as, say, a haunting, unholy trauma. Not helping the uninspired ad campaign that accompanied the release. Sure enough, the critics hated it, and audiences largely said no thank you too. But beyond the standard cult classic status that so many box office bombs have found redemption in, Clifford has been much more reevaluated in the 30 years since its conception. That might be cold comfort to the filmmakers who worked so very hard on this concept and who clearly, vividly recalled the initial blistering response. But hey, that was then, and this is now. At Vulture, the entertainment arm of New York Magazine, screenwriter Rob Turbovsky, a self-admitted devotee of Clifford, decided to publish a long series of quotes, a very long series of quotes, from those closest to its production, as well as some of its biggest fans. not go on to make $100 million as predicted by more than one Hollywood bigwig, but it certainly did make an impression. We usually open just after sunset, so hit that bell and anything else you can think of, really. And hey, join us next time with Jeff Bridges as a male hustler in a film that's truly insane in the yin-yang. And now, folks, it's time to say goodnight. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. You and I are the best of friends. And we are, aren't we? Shut up. But if you even look at me funny, if you do one thing that I find weird, which is, you know, like your middle name. See, you're doing it right now. Can you just act like a human boy for one minute here? Look at me like a person. You can't do it for more than a few seconds. Look at me like a human boy. Don't mess around with me. You're going to be back on that plane. You understand me? I understand that I love you. All right, all right, all right. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go.